The following podcast is for informational purposes only. The contents of this podcast do not constitute tax, legal, or investment advice. Take responsibility for your own decisions, consult with the proper professionals, and do your own research. But for tech, I understood as much as, as I need. And what I know about the graph is that my team members who are more technical are very enthusiastic and Great. it is part of our stack. Welcome to the GRTIQ podcast. Today I'm speaking with Julian Zavistowski, director at Golem Foundation. Julian is co founder and longtime leader at Golem, a project that has evolved and transformed since the early days. And Julian's here to take us inside the transformation and what Golem is working on now. Since entering the blockchain space in 2013, Julian has applied his economics and policy background to drive innovation and create decentralized infrastructure for public good. Growing up in Poland, Julian witnessed the country's historic transformation away from communism, a pivotal experience that sparked his fascination with economics while shaping his mission to drive decentralization and working in Web3. During this interview, Julian discusses his journey from Golem Factory to the Golem Foundation, exploring the evolution of decentralized computing, the importance of public goods funding, and the future of Web3. Julian also shares his insights on Ethereum staking, the challenges of decentralized coordination, and his team's use of the graph. I started the conversation by asking Julian about his background. Hello, Nick. Thank you for having me. That's a great pleasure. So I'm Polish. I was born and raised in Poland, where I still live, despite of being like a part of the global movement. <laughs> and as a young person, were you interested in tech? What types of things were you sort of hobbies or interests you had? That's kind of a complex question. If you want to learn about like shaping experience, I think for my generation, like a side note, I'm 45. So I was born in 19... 19- 79, so I was 10 in 1989, where like a communism ended in Poland and we like rapidly transferred into like a capitalistic system or kind of capitalistic system because 90s were kind of like a wild east here in Central Eastern Europe. And, and I think that's the experience of, of my generation here. So, of course, technology is like a significant part of it. Because we had the sudden inflow of technology. Like before 1989, of course, we, we had some technology. I, I had like the Atari computer, for example, that I got in 1988, I think. So that was like the, and before that, I had like a Commodore, Commodore Plus 4, which was like a, even better than Atari, but you know, like we didn't have that many games available for that platform. It was not that successful as, as Commodore 64, for example. So yes, of course, like the tech was like a, always something that I was like a, quite fascinated and quite into. I was never as much into it as like a software engineers or like a engineers in general. I, I was raised in the quite artistic family. And only when I decided to study economics, I, I moved into like a little bit more, let's say like a mathematical world, not really like a software development world, but a mathematical world. I know you were young when that evolution happened in 89 from communism to capitalism, but I do want to ask you this question about, do you see the introduction of like crypto and blockchain as another similar type of step when you think about it from an economics perspective? I mean, is the move from something just like capitalism to a global economy made possible by crypto a similar leap, do you think? I think that... Yes, but of course, you have to add like a many asterisks to that. So when communists ended in Poland, like the capitalism or like a liberal democracy, like it kind of like it filled the vacuum that emerged after the, the collapse of that, like a terrible corrupted system. Whatever you think about capitalism, it works so much better 
than Kyrie's. That, you know, this is like out, out of the question. Despite all the hurdles and, and hardships of the transformation, which were great, like uh, and that also like, you know, sh- shaped my generation or shaped like the, the Poland as it is, or this part of Europe, more broadly speaking. I think with crypto, it is much more difficult. So, so I, I believe that, you know, like at least like a parts of like a web free movement, but parts of like a technologies or even systems that we are designing, that we try to create may repair what is broken in capitalism or even like replace that in, 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 in many instances, because you know, like the nineties were the time of, of the triumph of, of liberal capitalism of of democracy. Everyone, at least in this part of the world, was like convinced that it really works, that this is great. Now, you know, like a fast forward, like a 35 years, and we see that the system is, is breaking apart. So we need to move somewhere. And I think like a Web3 is one of the like a very real attempts to, to create something new, something that will like advance us and move us forward. And, and of course, you know, there is a lot of like a terrible things in our space as well, which <laughs> does not help. But at the end of the day, it might be similar in a way that it may replace some institutions and some systems that do not work at the moment. It might be different because I firmly believe that this will be evolution and not revolution as it happened, you know, in 1989 in, in this part of work. Julian, when I have guests like you on the podcast that have a background in economics, I always like to sort of ask this follow-up question, and it's a common question. I always ask it, which is, how do you think history will sort of explain the emergence of blockchain and Web3? Will they see it as like a evolutionary step in tech? It's just sort of evolved Web1, Web2, Web3. Will they explain it as like a revolution against Web2, a bunch of people angry, or will it be sort of an economic type of explanation where it was just sort of a new system to replace old systems? So, I mean, a broad question, and it could be something else, but how do you think they'll explain it? I think that in reality, what we see and how it will be described in the future is a struggle. It is a struggle to change the system through the change of attitudes. Let's take a step back and think like a why like a web one become like a web too, and then it like evolved into something that we don't really like that much anymore. Well, of course, like a web is great, you know, like technology is great. Like uh, we, we do like an amazing thing that we wouldn't imagine like a few years back and that wouldn't dream about like uh, two decades ago. But then, you know, the same tech allows you to do like a uh, great things and, and bad things. And at the end of the day, I think this is like how you apply technology to those things. So even with the like a technology revolution and technology like it changes that like a come in a revolutionary way, it is up to us how we use it. And even in Web3, you can see the struggle between people who are very much oriented into like a advancing like a new systems, like attracting people to doing things that are great for for freedom, for you know, for humankind. And also like there are projects in our space that try to replicate the same shit all over again, like a using new tech, like a, like a, in a different way, sometimes perhaps like a better way, sometimes worse way. But I think this is like a struggle to change the attitude. So you do not only need tech, you also need people to believe that the change is needed. And I think this is especially true for Web3 because like, let's admit that Web3 kind of, like, I hate to say that, but Web3 kind of has a usability problem. And I think it will always have, because like with Eric Schaum, the easiest way, the most convenient way is to give away your freedom. Like uh, (laughs) the most basic example with the the private keys and your, you know, like a seed phrase and and, and so on. In a way, of course, this is great. You are like the custodian of yourself in, in a way. That might be not only your money, but your identity, your everything. But, you know, for many people, it is just too, too hard. They don't want that kind of freedom. And on the one way, we, we have to build like, uh, with things that make things easier, like, uh, I don't know, like account abstraction, all these social proofs and, and so on, to, to, to make that something like at least usable for, for like, uh, 
regular guy. But on the other hand, like we, we have to convince people, we have to make people believe that this change is needed. And we are perhaps coming closer and closer to that point. So, so people do understand more and more often that the system we have at the moment, and I'm, I'm not broadly speaking about like the, the economy or, or politics, but I think about technology is broken in, in so many ways. So if we return then to your personal story, you grew up in Poland, you ended up going to university and studying economics. What motivated you at that point in your life to sort of pursue a degree in economics? And what were you sort of envisioning as a career path? Yeah, we are coming back to this like transformation period, early capitalism. Because I, I started my studies in 1998. We were only like nine years in into that transformation. For people of my generation, on the one hand, like a, all the changes were like a fascinating and this like a rapid like a economic development was, was amazing. But on the other hand, people realized that you're on your own now. You have to like earn money. You have to, like, you have to provide. And then like the practical choices of occupations like were were predominant. So so basically I, I chose economics because I thought this is like the like the good pre- career path. You know, I, I hate my young self for like uh, being so practical and down to earth, but but this is how it is. Like this is how it was. So I was like a kind of quite skilled but not genius in quite quite everything. I could do pretty much anything I wanted after after high school. And I picked Warsaw School of Economics because back then it was considered like, you know, like one of the best universities in Poland, like a place to study, to work for great multinational corporations for a huge pay. And you know, that was what I thought was like a like a practical choice back then. Funnily enough, I, I never worked for for any corporation or e- even not for any like a private business like a per se. <laughs> if we apply that personal experience you and your family and so many others had in 89 moving from communism to capitalism, and then you went and studied economics. So now you have sort of an academic understanding of the different mechanisms at play there. If you were hired as a consultant, to a country or somebody, something that was moving a system like that, moving away from one system into the other, what would be the one insight, the one thing that you sort of learned firsthand that you would say, hey, make sure you watch out for this? What would it be? Transformation in Poland was so kind, like a shock transformation. So everything they changed like that in a day, literally. That came at a huge social cost. And we have like a never-ending dispute if that was necessary, if that social cost could be like a lower. I believe that what we can see in, in the society right now is that they were probably so massive that like a society is maybe not permanently, but like a, for a long time, like a divided into groups that like benefited from the transformation uh, did not benefit from the transformation. And and of course, like it is getting like a better and better now, but you can still see, you know, this rift. And especially now in a times of like a political polarization, in a times of like a people not being really able to cooperate anymore, like uh, but but rather entrenching, you know, in different like a camps, different tribes. I think that processes that date back to 1989, like it makes that problem like much greater in Poland right now. My advice would be like a, that even if you are like a very like a liberal economist, you, you should really like a consider like a social cost of all the changes. This also comes from like a studying economics that, you know, on paper, everything looks great. You've got only numbers. And but at the end of the day, like the like a perfect model never exists in, in reality. And you always have people who are like left behind because they are not able to move from one city to another, that are not able to retrain in a month to get a new job because like the like a capital comes to the different places than like a where where the like a top creation happens in the different places than top destruction and so on and so on. I could like a, really dig into that, but 
I actually worked as, as a consultant in, in economics for many years. <laughs> well, let's talk about that. So after graduating from the School of Economics, how did you get started professionally? What was sort of that early career period for you and what were you doing? I actually started working before graduating because that was like the, the way of like doing things back then. And my first job was like a pretty fascinating one because I worked for the National Bank of Poland and I was in, in a group of assistants to Professor Leszek Balcerowicz, who back then was the president of National Bank of Poland. At the end of the 80s and then the beginning of the 90s, he was like the most prominent like a government person responsible for economic transformation. <laughs> so like some of the things I, I'm, I'm telling you about that, pure, maybe that or not like a first hand, but from like the group of people who really like watched that happening. Of course, I was 10 back then, so I was not part of it. I, I became like the, they, this like a group of assistants only in 2004. And what did you do after that? I mean, did you kind of stay within that traditional finance sector or did you? Well, that, that, was, that was not really like a f financial sector because that was like a national bank of Poland. So that was like a central bank. I worked, you know, on the analytical position there. And, and I decided that I really loved like a understanding like the system from within. I decided that the like a economic policy is, is, is my career path. So I transferred to like a ministry. Back then it was called like a ministry of economy, labor and social affairs. So that was like a huge, huge institution. And I lead the unit for like a labor market analysis back then. And then after like a couple of years, I left like the, the government sector and I co-funded with a couple of friends, like a um, Institute for Structural Research, which still is like, you know, I'm not active within uh, institute anymore, but uh, it is uh, one of the leading like uh, think tanks in in economics in Poland. What led you to co-found that? I mean, that's sort of an entrepreneurial jump. Clearly, you had some background here. You'd done some very cool things related to economic policy. You got an inside look at central banking. So, where did the idea and sort of the interest come for launching something like the Stru Institute for Structural Research? Well, you know, we, back then we were twenty something. When you are 20 something, you, you are absolutely sure that you know how things should be organized around you. And when you are at the, like a governmental institution, you are not necessarily listened to. So you are telling them, you know, like what's the, like a proper thing to do and they don't want to listen to you. If you cannot stand that, the, the logical move is just to create your own thing and start like a, telling them what to do from outside or let them hire you as a consultant to tell them what to do. So that was the, the reason, that was the plan. To some extent it worked because we created an institution that, you know, like sustained, is, is, is successful, is, is reputable. And in some areas it didn't work that well because they still didn't listen to us. The GRTIQ podcast is made possible by a generous grant from the Graf Foundation. The Graph Grounds program provides support for protocol infrastructure, tooling, gaps, subgrafts, and community building efforts. Learn more at the Graph.Foundation. That's the Graph.Foundation. Hi, this is GRTIQ, and thank you for listening. Listeners who enjoy this content can help support the GRTIQ podcast by leaving a review or a five-star rating wherever they download podcasts, by sharing episodes on social media, or by simply telling a friend or colleague about something they heard or learned from one of our guests. It's support from listeners like you that make it possible for us to keep shining a light on the people and stories behind Web3 and the graph. So... That kind of takes us to sort of the mid 2000s. We're in the 2006, 2007 era here. When and at what point do you become aware of blockchain and crypto? And what was sort of the first impression when you came across it? Apart from like some, you know, glimpses of articles in, in newspapers, I, I got really interested in, I think, 2013, like a late 2013. 
that was about the time when the Vitalik's paper on Ethereum was published. So, so that was in fact my like a uh, first interaction when I heard about that. Well, my my, my first impression of, of crypto was that it is like a Ponzi scheme, and I think this is the like this, this the same for like many many people with the background in economics. What changed my mind was like learning more about like the how Ethereum was back then planned to work all the like a smart contract functionalities and like we had like a lot of discussions about potential use cases for Ethereum very early on and my favorite back then and my favorite still is everything governance related or more specifically everything related to coordination of like how groups of people take decisions how they allocate resources, what mechanism you can design for that system to work and for that agents to like uh, behave in a certain way. And that's what like, convinced me that this is uh, a real thing. If you think back then to that period of time in 2013, those were early, early days. And you fast forward to where we are today, over a decade later, and you think about how you were thinking about governance and coordinating agents and how that's all made possible through something like Ethereum. Do you think we're on track? Like, did we sort of fulfill that early vision you had? Or is there still some gaps or room to improve? What, what are your thoughts? There is always room to improve, but I think we are finally on track. So because 10 years ago, we didn't have technology to do anything, like honest. In theory, functionality was there to do like a cool stuff. Like we had smart contracts. We, we had like the, the basic Ethereum network, but because of like the, all the limitations in terms of usability and capacity and all the like building blocks that were not there, it was impossible to use in, in any like a meaningful way. And, and I think that like a, finally we are getting there the like, correct right now. My first impression that we are like a really getting there was when L2s like started taking off. And when we finally see that you can build applications, you can build like a use cases where gas cost is not like a dramatic like a blocker of of, of pretty much everything. I, I could also like a dig into that, but but I think that's it. Yeah, there's a lot of discussion to be had about L2s and we might get there as we progress along here, but I do want to kind of return then to your personal story and your trajectory here. So you're working at the Institute of Structural Research. It's something that you co-founded. You're putting out some great information and doing some consulting, but finding that sometimes on the other end, people aren't implementing or exactly following. At some point, I guess this idea for launching something called Golem Factory comes to your mind. Can you talk to us about the origin story there? Like, What were you thinking about what was the problem you were contemplating and what are the origins sort of behind this idea of Golem Factory? This is actually a fun story. So I think it was like early 2014 and it was, it was actually St. Valentine's uh, Day of uh, so 14 uh, February. And we learned that Gavin Wood is, is in town. And back then, our plan was to like a spin up like a, with the software development unit from Institute for Structural Research or like for other company that create based on that. So we were looking for people to work for in, in software development. And <laughs> incidentally, like a gaming would came across through like a common friends and asked, we heard you have like a couple of teams, like a let's talk about cooperation. So I went with like a two of my partners to meet him in a pizzeria on the evening of like a St. Valentine's Day 2014. We had all those couples having dates around us and the three of us like a drinking beer. And guess what? Gavin Wood, he didn't show up for whatever reasons. He was like a jet lax or, or something. Like we met him like a, after a couple of days, but then he didn't show up. So we were quite annoyed like a, about him like a spoiling our like a evening. And, and we started complaining like uh, how terrible this whole blockchain and Ethereum idea is because they get all the computers in the network to do basically the same. 
and how great it would be if they all could do something else, like just communicating like over the peer-to-peer network and like solving some complex problems. And then I I, I remembered like the like the short story by Stanislaw Lem, who is like the who was like the great Polish science fiction writer, and he had like a short story called 137 Seconds that basically describes the idea so that you have like the the network of computers that communicate together and solve like a complex problem. This is how it started. So the idea for the naming came from a popular sci-fi book from a well-known author. Like 137 seconds is not like a great name for a project. So we borrowed from another book of Stanislaw Lem, which was like a Golem 14. Golem 14 is a supercomputer that becomes like a superhuman artificial intelligence. <laughs> so, uh, and, and of course, the, that like a is like a reference to like a Jewish like golden um, Prague fairy tale. So, I want to ask you this question then about that move you're making from a career perspective. You're working sort of in this economic policy, and now you're moving into software and peer to peer, and you're launching sort of a new thing. Take us inside your mind there a little bit. I mean. Are you starting to feel the call of being an entrepreneur? Are you starting to feel some momentum like this is a real problem or is this all an experiment, something that you're just trying, moving into tech and seeing sort of what happens? What really happened was that I got fascinated by that idea of Golem we had and also about all the technology that I learned that was emerging back then that we call Web3 right now, then we call that like a blockchain space, like a Ethereum and so on. And that was like a gradual move. So we we still did like everything we did before in economic policy analysis, but gradually we are devoting more and more our time to this new thing. And and of course the, the turning point was when we did the successful crowdfunding for, for Golden. Then it was like obvious that we have to move like a full time to that project that there is no like room for distractors anymore. So what's the move then from Golem Factory to Golem Foundation and Network? Can you describe just sort of how those three things evolved one after another or maybe, you know, in parallel? Sure. So after like, having this initial Golem idea, we, we started working on that as early as 2014. So for like uh, two years, that was like a kind of like a hobby project like uh, within, the, within the company. And then in 2016, we did the crowdfunding. So all of a sudden we had like a massive funding. We could like hire a lot of engineers. We could start like a, doing that for real. And, but then in, in 2018, 2019, I started noticing like a pulse the in the initial idea so so i i realized maybe it took me a little bit too long as a non-software engineer but i started realizing that this is that this is like a massive project with like a massive problems to be solved and chances that we are going to fail are incredibly high and because of that i decided that as this crowdfunding event created viability on us. Maybe not like a legally speaking, but like a morally speaking in terms of like the token that we issue. So back then I had an idea of setting apart some of the funding in the form of Golden Foundation to look for another use cases that would benefit the LM ecosystem, basically. So would contribute to the token, still being in line with the original values of Golem and, and Ethereum and then Web3. Of course, there is always like the, like the, the second boss. The story, the thing is that like a part of the team was convenient that, that we have funding for doing like the Golem network for the next 100 years. And this is how much it is going to take. And like a part of the team that was still convinced that this is a great idea to work on it and that they will succeed. And that, that was also one of the reasons that we, that we created that split. Because I think the pivot is like a very natural thing for like every startup or every technology project. 
like uh, if you look at Gnosis, for example. So, so Gnosis crowdfunding was like a couple of months after us. And, and, and they like a, she voted like, I don't know, like a five times, six times on the way. And they are quite successful in some of their ventures that they were, they, they haven't even thought about them when they raised the funding. And that was my thinking back then, that we, we have to iterate also with the new ideas. And that's how Golden Foundation was created. And this is why I moved to Golden Foundation. By the way, I still believe in a basic Golden network idea. I, I think this is like a, like a fascinating project, and a great project. But I had a feeling that I'm not able to run that project anymore because I didn't believe it will succeed. That if you don't believe that somehow something will succeed, then it's impossible to, to work. So you talk about the pivots, and as you said, a very natural thing for startups, especially in tech, to sort of do. And I've had a lot of founders and entrepreneurs on this podcast who have also pivoted. So if we go back then to the original idea, and we sort of mark where you are today, how would you describe what the Golem Network, the Golem Foundation's mission and vision is and the, and the things that it's working on? That also evolved over time. So, of course, we, we started... <laughs> very different things that we do right now. So like in 2018, we started something that we called back then uh, Wildland. And Wildland was also a very ambitious project that was focused on data sovereignty. So we wanted to abstract something that we call like a data container kind of like a Docker container. A Docker container is for some kind of logic that they can execute some, some, some kind of a program. And we wanted to create something similar for uh, just for data, like a data container that is like a totally abstracted from the infrastructure it is on. And the rationale for that was uh, coming from the two different directions. So one, we wanted to make that like a, like a hardware agnostic meaning that you could host your data pretty much everywhere. And you would not be that much reliant on a huge cloud storage providers. So you could like build your own thing. In, in that regard, it was a little bit similar to IPFS and, and Filecoin, that rather in what we wanted to achieve and not how we wanted to achieve. We, want, we, we have like a totally different approach technology-wise. And then on top was a layer of data management. So we wanted to uh, tangle that with like a pretty novel approach to how you navigate through your data on a, on a file system level. Basically, we wanted to introduce something we call like a multipaths allowing to, you to express on a file system level a lot of logic that is like a database, allowing you to, to, to store a lot of information in a, how your data is organized on a file system level. Well, that project failed <laughs> for a number of reasons. We finally, like infinitely suspended it about a year ago. And at the same time, about two and a half years ago. So around the time when it was like asserting that the Ethereum staking like will become a real thing, we had the idea that evolves later into Octant. So I believe that staking is quite important milestone for a reason that Everyone understands, but I, I believe we tend to underestimate the importance of that change. That with staking, you are able to get reasonably risk-free interest on your capital within like a Web3 ecosystem. So of course, like people are in, in many different ways, they get, are getting like an enormous like return on 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 the capital, like a speculating or doing like whatever DeFi they do. That like a staking like a is, is is a real yield that is could be benchmarked as like a reasonably risk free. Of course, there is slashing there. Like there are a lot of things that can go wrong, but compared to all the alternatives, this is like a reasonably risk. 
that means that that opens the like economically speaking, it opens like the the path to doing things like the like in the traditional world, like a uh, rich foundations do or other like entities with these huge, huge endowment that can be used to generate capital and then do fascinating things with capital. So I will be totally honest. Like our, our diagnosis was that it's like a, we had like a, a lot of cool ideas, of course, for a lot of cool projects that given the fact that we raised funding back in 2016, maybe it's time to like give back something to people who funded us and to like a broader community rather than having fun with yet another like a startup project. And because of that, we, we, we structured Oxen in a way that we still have fun doing that. And we believe this is like a great project like that, that, you know, benefits everyone, but on some levels it cannot fail because, you know, you generate yield, you have that tokens, and then you give that tokens to cool projects, and you also reward your token holders for like participating in the system. So, of course, that can work better or worse, but in a way, like, it cannot fail as long as you have like the stream of funding coming from staking, which is kind of risk-free. So, it is poised to succeed like, that way or another. And I think that that diagnosis was like a pretty much correct. So like a token holders are happy with the rewards, and of course like a projects that get funding to like a build great things are also happy to get funding. And now our main focus is how to grow that thing and how to make this idea of regenerative public good funding and creating more and better coordination tools more and more widespread across the community. There's a blog post out there. I don't know if you've seen it or not, but the author of the blog post sort of argues that in Web3, the token is the product. When I hear your background trying different things, but also the success with the token and, and staking, where do you come in on that debate? I mean, is it the case that to, for a lot of Web3, the token is the product, or is it really about something else? It's about the tech. It's about the network. In, <laughs> in Web3, this is about what people believe in. So, you know, if you believe that token is a product, it is a product. As simple as that. And we may think it doesn't make sense. And in a way, it doesn't make sense very often. But it is real that people very often just believe in something. And it is real because they believe in that. Like, uh, I don't know. Take, <laughs> take dot coin. Like, uh, take like, uh, so many other like, uh, things that are around. They are around because people believe they are self. And then... There are so many real things that have like great tech and could <laughs> go to the moon. Sorry for that expression. But people don't know about that. And if they don't know about that, they, they, they don't believe in that. So those projects literally do not exist. No one cares. To sum it up, I don't like the attitude of token is the product. I think she, there should be something substantial behind it. And at the end of the day, the projects that have both believers and technology and great systems, they will survive and they will grow. But at the moment, it is what it is. So let's talk then about funding public good and the ways that people sort of can participate. So let's imagine that there's a listener here that's getting exposure to this for the first time. They're interested in participating. They want to understand how it works. And what's the best way to sort of get active? So Describe that. How should listeners sort of approach and think about getting involved? And so maybe I will first tell you how it works, and then I will tell you how I believe it should evolve and where we should go with it. At the moment, system is, is, is quite simple. So we generate yield on ETH staking. We are staking 100,000 ETH, so it generates like a three. 0.5 at the moment, 1,000 
per year around 750 ETH per quarter. And that pile of ETH is divided between DLM token holders who opt in to participate in the system. They have to opt in to participate. It's not enough to have uh, the token. You have to have the token and lock it into like the uh, octant uh, locking contract. And and by the way, like we we don't do anything with those stuff. We don't have any custody of them. You can unlock them at any moment. This is like just your declaration that the token is locked to participate. So part of the rewards goes to people locking their GLMs. Another part goes to matching fund and is finally distributed to the projects. And part of it stays with us to, to cover the cost of the system. There are also some like a smaller pockets for different things, but we don't need to go into details right now. So if you participate in the system, like with your GLMs lock, then every three months we have something called allocation window. Uh, at the beginning of allocation window, we attribute your individual reward to you. And its, it's amount is based on how much GLM you have locked. And you can use that GLM to donate to projects that are on the list in a given epoch, or you can keep them. And then like, we use quadratic funding formula to decide how the matching fund is distributed based on how people donated the project. So if you allocate all of your individual rewards yourself, then you've got the money, but you do not participate in the decision how the matching fund is allocated. If you allocate the project, then you have a say. Of course, this is like a kind of plutocracy because the more GLM you lock, the higher your reward, and then the bigger your potential vote. But with the quadratic funding, we equalize that. Not fully equalize that, but like the, the voting power of small players is, is pretty significant compared to the big, to the big players. This is like a pretty much it that happens every three months. And every three months, you, you take a decision whether to donate to the projects or keep the reward for yourself or both. You can, you can donate some, keep something for yourself. On top of that is the governance of like, a, what is the list of the project? Because at the end of the day, this is like a quite important. We try to keep that list like a reasonably short. Uh, first, to not create like a too much confusion for, uh, for, the, for the users. And second, we, we want to make this like a matching fund significant for the project. So if, we, if, if, if it was like a distributed among like a 300 or 3000 projects, then that would be peanuts for them. If this is like a couple dozens, then there's real funding that can make a difference. Mm, and also community, like a, everyone who locks tokens take part in the decision, like a, which projects are listed epoch to epoch. So this is also community decision. Of course, it is curated by asset. So we are still like a gatekeeper of like a who, who gets on, on the list. So this is how it is right now. If you want to participate in that, you can go to auction.app, see what kind of projects we fund. If you think that you love the projects, you want to be part of it, then you can get some GLM, you can lock them. And after some time, you will accumulate enough reward to make a difference during the allocation. I believe that that approach is correct on how we could fund things and how we could coordinate decisions in Web3. If you think about more distant future, so how we are going to build, I want to say like a brave new world, but maybe that's not like the best connotation, how we are going to build like the, the great new world. Um, I, I don't think we have the economic model for that right now. We don't have the funding model for that. We have, of course, like traditional like a venture cap funding. And we have some token sales and other methods this, this space experiments with. But if we are talking about creating technology, or not only technology, but other components that are not made for profit, we need some kind of public funding like or funding from the public to achieve that goal. And of course we do that. We, we've got like a great 
uh, huge projects that fund a lot of things within their ecosystem or even like within the whole ecosystem. We have like a retro funding, we have like grants for Ethereum Foundation, we have so many other things that like fund things in a non-for-profit way. But I still believe we are struggling to first make it sustainable, second build like a decent governance tools around that. And that's basically what we are experimenting with where we want to go further with it. So we envision right now the V2 octant which would allow pretty much anyone with capital to be part of it with their, with their communities in, and then with their ecosystems to use those like a coordination mechanism that we experiment with in the, in the future. <laughs> I think call to action right now is for the user that you can join Oxent, or if you don't think that would be fun at the moment is interesting, you can just think how your community, how your ecosystem, who's like a built similar thing using the tool set that we are creating. And I'll put links in the show notes for anybody that's interested in learning more and clicking through some things. So be sure to visit the show notes if you want to learn more. Julian, I just have a couple more questions for you. And then I'm going to ask you the GRT IQ 10. These are 10 questions I ask each guest every week. And it's a lot of fun. The first question I have is about your optimism about the future of the industry. So you got activated early, you've been building in the space and and thinking about solutions since kind of that 2014. Why are you still optimistic about the future of the industry? It seems like there's a lot of reasons out there to maybe not be optimistic. And of course, I don't hold these positions, but sometimes you hear that we have too much infra and not enough consumer facing dApps. Sometimes we hear there's too many L2s, we hear that like maybe something like Solana is going to come along and disrupt Ethereum. I mean, there's all these reasons for people to kind of get concerned, but you remain optimistic and you keep building. Why? I think the answer is identical to the answer why Web3 is not a Ponzi scheme. So we are coming back to like this, 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 this very first question. And <laughs> this is quite funny why it is not. But it is not because it has a mechanism built into it that makes it permanent. You, you, you cannot kill it. You cannot destroy it. Like uh, if this is a great blockchain with great tech in the, in the user base, it is essentially eternal. <laughs> at least at the current state of tech and the current state of economy. And I think this is especially true for Ethereum and an Ethereum ecosystem. It could get smaller, you know, crypto winter is the real thing. I, I think we'll experience one very soon, but this is good. For people who are long-term in the industry, you probably heard that already, like a so-called winter is usually the, the most productive and the, the most fun period. So I think that each cycle we are becoming stronger. And I also think that we are past the point where we had like a huge growth of the, of the last 10 years. So the industry kind of stabilized. So I don't expect such huge growth as we had in the past, but I also don't expect the next winter will be as harsh as, as the previous. And through that, selection mechanism, I think we'll have like a less and less greed in this space and more and more people who are really after making a difference. So this is where I'm. How important is this component of decentralization to the future of the industry? I mean, you said it earlier, there's a lot of projects building in the space that look and smell a lot like a Web2 type of product or organization. And some of it's even worse tech than what we find in Web 2. But there is this element of decentralization that really delineates Web 3 tech from Web 2 tech. So how important is it in your mind to sort of the future of the industry? It is mission critical. Maybe not in a, in a technical sense. So, so you don't have to decentralize everything. But when you will come to the fun questions part, I will talk about that more. But what is like, really important is user agency. So the user is the one 
to, to decide about things, uh, not someone else. And you can, technically speaking, you do not have to decentralize everything, but you have to build power structures that ensure that this is the users, this is the community that is in charge. So Julian, as you probably know, a lot of my listeners are enthusiastic about the graph and you talked a little bit about data in the beginning of your history, sort of in Web3 back in 2018 and some of the things you were thinking about. Are you aware of the graph protocol and do you sort of have an opinion or a perspective on what it's doing? <laughs> as not a software engineer, I don't have a very strong opinion. <laughs> I'm on this like a mechanism design level and <laughs> ideology. But for tech, I understand as much as, as I need. And what I know about the graph is that my team members who are more technical are very enthusiastic and it is part of our stack. I think you do a great job and I wish you continue it as a part of our common efforts to make, make Web3 great. And then Julian, the final question before I ask you the GRTIQ10 is sort of a life lesson or insight question. And it's for any listener out there who wants to sort of do what you did, right? You were working, you became an entrepreneur, you started building in Web3. You must have learned a lot of lessons and insights along the way there. What's one or two sort of entrepreneur slash building in Web3 insights that you could share with anybody listening who wants to do something that you did? Maybe you'll save them some heartache and some time from having to learn it themselves. My experience dates back 2000. 14, as, as we said, this, this is when I entered the space. And sometimes I think it's not relevant anymore because in a way, everything was so much easier and so much harder about that. I think the most important lesson is just to focus on what you believe in and what you think will be great. Because at the end of the day, the burning passion is the most important thing that will decide about the success or the lack of it. Uh, if you don't have it, then everything will be forced. Maybe you will do some things, but you will not have as much fun as you could have. So I think this burning passion is the most important. I appreciate you sharing that. So as I said, I'm now going to ask you the GRT IQ 10. 10 questions I ask each week. I do it because I hope listeners will learn something new, try something different, or achieve more in their own life. But I also enjoy it because it allows us to get to know you a little bit more on the personal side. So Julian, are you ready for the GRT IQ 10? Yes, I will try to do my best. The GRT IQ 10. This is the way. 10 questions for astronauts floating in space. Q. What book or article has had the most impact on your life? A lot. But for the purpose of that conversation, I would call Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman. So I think this, this book is, was written in the 80s, but I think it describes like uh, everything, all the failures of our public discourse and social media perfectly. So... That guy basically, like, uh, why social media are terrible before social media were created. Like, uh, that's amazing. Is there a movie or a TV show that you would recommend everybody should watch? <laughs> for preparing for the interview, I thought about Apocalypse Now by Francis Ford Coppola. This is like a great movie, like a director cut. But actually, after that conversation, I think I would recommend you Tyler Monahan talk from Defcon. Osaka 2018, about how Web3 can compete with the Web2 projects without losing like a Web3 values. It's, it's, it's a great talk. And I know like a five years is eons in the space, but I think it's still worth watching. Tyler Monahan, by the way, is, is, is co-founder of my crypto and my Ethereum wallet for the record, which people do not know. And Julian, if you could only listen to one music album for the rest of your life, which one would you choose? <laughs> that changes, of course, like as people age. But at the moment, that would be Rogskop, Profound Mystery Street. This is like a Norwegian electronic music. What's the best advice someone's ever given to you? I think this is like to do things instead of rationalizing why not to do things. Because, you know, people are great in rationalizing and you can always find excuses why not to do something. 
what's one thing you've learned in your life that you don't think most other people have learned or know quite yet? So everyone knows that phrase. I know that I know nothing, but I think people rather remember about it. What's the best life hack you've discovered for yourself? You know, I'm, I'm obsessed with time and especially with timelines. So I think the best advice uh, here is to try to estimate how much time you need for a task and do not start that before you need to start it because Parkinson's law is real. So if you start too early, you will spend all the time doing that. And then based on your own life experiences and observation, what's the one habit or characteristic that you think best explains why or how people find success in life? People are very often too busy. They get doing sort of trivial things. And this is fine because life is a combination of trivial things. But it is very easy to like, lose yourself in, in that. So you need brains and courage to something, do something that is brave, that is not tribal. And then everything starts there. And then, Julian, the final three are complete the sentence type questions. The first one being, the thing that most excites me about the future of Web3 is? Octant. And how about this? If you're on Twitter, some people call it hex. I still call it Twitter. Then you should be following. You should quit Twitter. Not the first time a guest has suggested that. And then the last question, Julian, I'm happiest when? When I run. The GRT IQ 10. And I show you how deep the podcast. Julian, thank you so much for joining the GRT IQ podcast. It was a lot of fun to get to know you and to hear your backstory. It's super interesting. And as I said, for listeners that are interested in learning more, I'll put links in the show notes if they want to click in and dive further on the things that you and your team are working on. If anyone wants to stay in touch with you, follow the things that you're working on, the things that you're building, what's the best way for them to stay in touch? I think the easiest way of communicating with us as a team, as a project, is joining our Discord. Like there is like a very active community there, and it's like a, we are there all the time. This has been a production of the GRT IQ podcast. For more information, including detailed show notes, visit grtiq.com slash podcast. That's grtiq dot com slash podcast. Please consider contributing to this project and helping build the community by subscribing and leaving a review. G R T I Q Podcast.